Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first Adoro Learning Advisory Board YouTube Live session. We are super excited to be here and kind of share with you some of our thoughts on social media. Our theme for today is Social Media, a Global Perspective. And we have advisory board members from all over the world, and I will let them introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, there are a few people that are either running late or might miss the session today, so we don't want to forget about them. Um, and they are Rebecca Madrid, uh, she's in Yokohama, Japan, Scott Beebe in Mary Marysville, Washington, and Cynthia and Liv both in, actually, I don't know what state they live in. Pana, what state do they live in? They're in New Hampshire. New Hampshire, okay, in New Hampshire, USA. So we have all areas of the globe um, highlighted here, but uh, only a few, only some of us are here today. So I'll start. My name is Kim, and I live in Bangkok, Thailand, but I'm from the United States. And I'm going to just call on people in here so we introduce everybody and I noticed that Ben is very kindly muting his mic, but you happen to be the first person on my list. So Ben, will you introduce yourself, sure. please? Uh, this is, uh, I'm Ben Sheridan. I'm currently living in Bangkok, Thailand, working at NIST International School. Um, thank you. Brian, can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, my name is Brian Lockwood, and I'm currently at Copenhagen International School in Denmark. And Chrissy. And I'm Chrissy Hellier, and I'm currently living in Perth, Australia, and working full time for a Juro Learning. Woohoo! Clint. Hi, I'm Clint, and I'm currently at the International School of Beijing in China. Carrie Lee. Can we hear Carrie Lee? Hi there. I'm um, working at Gems World Academy in Switzerland and looking forward to chatting with you all today. Awesome. And last but not least, Pana. Hi, I'm Pana and I currently work at Taipei American School. Yay. Thanks, everyone. So our idea for these podcasts is to just kind of have a conversation. And we wanted to start with this idea of social media because we know it's something that's on the minds of lots of teachers and parents. And we thought it would be a good kind of starting point to see how these YouTube live sessions go. So kind of to get us started, kind of kickstart the conversation, which apps are popular in your region of the world? And why do you think those particular apps are really interesting to the people from kind of your area where you're in right now? I'll start off. Thanks. Because I did a little bit of research. I was a bit of a nice. nerd. And um, I looked up what was really popular in the app store for Australia and New Zealand. And then I talked to my 15 year old son and his friends to see what was sort of popular amongst them. And then I had a chat to my older daughters in New Zealand to see what kind of apps were really popular with them. So what I got from that was really, really interesting. And I'm sort of still processing what I discovered, but the most popular apps sort of um, for, for my age group <laughs> are, um, Mainly the communication apps. So we're talking uh, Facebook, um, Instagram, Messenger, and also very, very popular is YouTube and Spotify. So there's um, a lot of um, consumption apps, I think, are quite popular. What seems to be really popular amongst the younger generation is um, apps also to communicate, but they're using um, Messenger mainly or other apps that don't cost them anything to send text messages. They're not voice calling each other, they're um, sending messages and using either Messenger or um, Snapchat is, is a teeny bit popular, but not as popular as I thought that I, I would find it over here and or down under. And they're using, um, the uh, what's the other one? Oh, there's a gaming app. So it's not an app that's used on your phone, but um, uh, very popular amongst Ben's friends, he's 15 and a very um, avid gamer, is the app Discord, which is only available on desktop or through your Xbox at the moment. So that was Different very, very interesting. Not me. <laughs> uh, yeah, not, yeah, Ben Sheridan is not my son. <laughs> <laughs> Rumor. So that was very interesting. I was surprised because I expected to see a lot more creation apps being popular but still the consumption apps are very very popular both amongst 
um, the older generation and the younger generation. So that was surprising to me. Uh, I'll go next because it's easy in China. Yeah. Um, we've got a team. <laughs> uh, for those, Gee, why is yeah, it? Well, for those who don't know, WeChat started, I think, initially as basically a, a clone of WhatsApp. And ever since then, it's just grown and grown and grown. So I think a lot of Western uh, social, social media companies actually look at WeChat and are like, oh my goodness, that's what we want to be. It's this all-in-one ecosystem. From WeChat, I can obviously chat with all my friends. Um, I can order a taxi. The Chinese Uber is linked in there. I can order food. I can pay my bills. I can buy uh, flights and book hotel rooms. It's just this amazing all-in-one app that does everything. Um, and can you transfer money to friends oh, or yeah. to anyone? Yeah. yeah I, can transfer, I, I pay. Wow. Like, this is Apple Pay. Like you have a billion people who are using it. Like Apple wishes you would use Apple Pay. Um, I can walk up to the lady who's selling pork buns on the street and for you know one quai, so about 15 US cents, I can send that money. It's essentially free. I don't know where they make their money off of that. Um, but it does everything. I don't need my wallet. I don't need anything. I just need WeChat. Um, and a lot of the, the, the Western social media are blocked in China. So Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, those sorts of things. Um, very difficult to get access to at times. So it drives all of the traffic into WeChat. I feel like there's a lot to talk about with WeChat and especially in mm. school communities too, like mm. having just been in China for the last couple of weeks with Clint for Clint and Ben at Learning2 for a little while and then um, at another school for uh, another week. I feel like there's a lot to talk about with WeChat. But before we get like any deeper into WeChat, does anybody else have any other um, thoughts to share on social media that's popular in their region? Yeah, so when I'm here. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, oh, anybody go? Gonna, sorry, I'll go first. Um, what I'm finding here in Denmark is that um, the with with children, with the younger kids, they like to use Instagram. Uh, high school kids seem to be liking uh, Snapchat, um, and the adults like uh, Facebook. Um, but that's about it. There's not a lot of use of uh, other social media. Facebook is almost king here in the Scandinavia area, at least Denmark. I don't know. Um, it's kind of interesting. If you open up Periscope, and that's uh, uh, Twitter's uh, live streaming app, it's kind of interesting to see where the dots show up. And in Denmark, it's quite vacant. There's not a lot. But if you go up to Sweden, it's just full of uh, activity. And so something's different about Sweden compared to Denmark as far as social media. They seem to be much more active in uh, sharing their whatever experiences they have. And in Denmark, I don't see that. That's interesting. Mm. Can I stay in Europe for a minute and add the Swiss perspective? Um, I'd have to echo what Brian's saying. It seems very much like Instagram and Snapchat are the, um, are the apps of choice here. And I would say that would be because they're very visual and partly because they can have content that disappears. And I think that's super important. They've probably had lots of people hammering them about, you know, your internet footprint, your digital footprint, and all of that sort of stuff. And that's taken, they've taken that on board, and for better or worse, they're um, definitely putting their stories there. Um, Facebook's for sure happening for adults, but I don't see it necessarily as a medium for, um, for students. But Snapchat's where it's at for them. It's funny, I find it's the same thing here in Taiwan too, though. I mean, at least in the community at school, because well, no, that's not true. Out on the streets, the selfie culture is very, very big here. So that, I'm assuming, is going mostly to Instagram. But that's an, an assumption. So I think that the visual aspect is pretty heavily influential out here, too. All right. <laughs> um, line is huge here. So I tried to resist it when I moved here. Um, I'm like, oh, not one more thing. But everybody's online. It's insane. It's like 97% of people who have mobile phones have line on it or some crazy number like that. Um, it's pretty cool. It's, it's sort of, I think it's the maybe Japanese version of WeChat. You know, it's, it's trying to incorporate everything into one. Um, people share, I think like a lot of adults, especially the Thai adults that I know are on Facebook as well, but they seem to share a lot in line. Um, and they create these groups and like today, just today this mom, 
showed me this birthday party that happened over the weekend for her son and was like, everything was in line. It was insane. And, you know, I had a session last week and this mom said, well, I don't have any storage on my phone because so-and-so shared 500 photos or something like that. So it's like, she's got sync to download or something. Um, but I actually, Twitter over the last year has grown by like over 40% or something in Thailand, which was kind of surprising. And Instagram also seems to have grown a, a huge amount over the last, last year. And Snapchat doesn't seem to have a huge presence um, in Thailand. It's pretty small compared to, to many of the other ones. And then I think Messenger um, seems to be pretty popular as well. So being like, I'm going to sound like a super creep, but I've been like looking over people's shoulders on the BTS, on the train system to see what people are looking at, like just out of curiosity and totally would echo everything Ben has said. People are almost exclusively on Instagram, Facebook, or line when I see them. And I've had some interesting conversations with my Thai friends about how, not just how they use social media, but how they use the internet. And I'm going to get like super deep here for a second and maybe that will connect us back to the conversation about WeChat and China and stuff too. And maybe even the Denmark, Sweden thing. I think because the, and I am talking maybe entirely out of turn. I've only lived in Thailand uh, this time for, this is my second year, third year, third year. And I lived here before for three years, but I think because the culture is so much about building, um, building knowledge through connections and like working within a community and being so kind of community driven as opposed to like abstract um, content uh, consumption. I think the fact that they like or they interact so much through line has to do with that community culture. And I, I've asked a couple of friends like, well, how do Thai people find answers to questions? Like, do they Google it? And my Thai friends are like, no, they don't Google anything. They ask their friends in line. And I said, but what if the friends have the wrong answer and like then that's what they think the wrong answer because it's most important to get the information from your community than it is to get like to search some random if that makes sense and i just think that's such an interesting reflection of the culture because it's kind of about us as a group as opposed to me as an individual finding my answer did that I make can, sense i can confirm mm -hmm. that because my parents oh, yes, thank you my an actual Thai person <laughs> So yeah, my parents are actually doing that online all the time and they're sending and forwarding this information to me, although I almost never respond, but when it's wrong, I do. And it's fascinating. really fascinating because their little group is like, my dad is in a group with his high school buddies and my mom has her girlfriends and they're just circulating this information. Sometimes it's years, years old and that's all they know. It's basically becoming an, an echo chamber for either mm -hmm. correct answers or incorrect answers. And, but nobody is there to go, wait, maybe that's not right. Nobody's checking in on, on the actual veracity of the information that they're sharing. Not at all. Well, I think it's that community we're like coming to like understanding through community as opposed to through facts. And I don't mean that in a critical, like talking down way. I, I mean that in a genuine, I think that's how it works way. Right. Right. That's interesting. I'm curious about, um, you know, what other in other parts of the world where Twitter is, because in in Denmark, um, Twitter seems to be primarily politicians and famous people. I have found um, some teachers using it, but I didn't find it through Twitter. I found it through meeting them through ed camps and meeting them through different local events, but very small niche of uh, sharing through Twitter. I wonder what uh, other parts of the world are looking like. Are you thinking about Japan, Brian? Because Brian and myself and Clint have all lived in Japan. Has anybody else here lived in Japan? No, right? And Twitter is really big in Japan. Yeah, when I was in Japan, Twitter was amazing. It was just like, I got so much interaction when I was there and I haven't repeated that experience anywhere else in the world. <laughs> mm. For me, like as a professional, I feel like Twitter is kind of losing its luster a little bit. Yeah. You know, mm. I, I think it's it's kind of oversaturated almost. And what made it really good sound like a hipster back in the day when it was really <laughs> cool. Um, but made it what made it really good to begin with was I felt like I had really good connections with a, a small group of people around the world. 
And I still have those really good connections with that small group around the world. It's just not on Twitter yeah. because I feel like there's so much noise that mm. you're trying to shift, sift through in order to get to the good stuff. And I have no doubt there's still like lots of amazing stuff that's out there. But now it's, you know, it's the same as the, the, the students, right? They're moving away from public sharing and they're going into private groups, whether it's in WhatsApp or Line or Facebook Messenger or WeChat. It's instead of one to everybody communication, it's it's kind of pre-selected many to many conversations. So um, where are you having that group now? You said you're still connected to that group of people. Where would you describe that you are most connected with that group? Um, that's a good question. A lot of it happens in Facebook now, like Facebook Messenger. I'm in like just a bunch of little groups here and there. I've got WeChat groups here and there. It just depends on who those people are and where they're located. Um, for me, it's easier if everything's. I'm in, in groups on Twitter with you, though. <laughs> well, we're, we're in Twitter groups, yeah. Um, but I feel like the 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 Twitter now, the Twitter conversations are less about conversations, more about just pushing out resource. Yes. Yeah, but see, I also feel like it depends on where where you're at too it's like you bring something to the tool as well you know and so i think you know for like i when i stepped out of p12 schools and went to university of kentucky you know i really my twitter use just really dived mm. and i didn't find any real value in spending a lot of time there but then when i came back overseas and i started teaching in p12 p12 again like my my use really like shot back up again and I find it's probably the, the space that I spend a lot of time like professionally. Right. Like if I want to, you know, and I have a lot of like conversations and I'm actually having really good conversations and, and around certain things um, in there. Like I'm taking this MOOC right now and um, there's some really good sort of conversations going on around um, the content in the MOOC using the MOOC hashtag and stuff. And there's like that ISC ed coach um, hashtag that seems pretty good. And, you know, I think, it, it, I do agree though. It's kind of, it's splintered a lot because we have so many different areas to have these conversations and a lot of us overlap in a lot of these different spaces. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like trying to carve out that one space that you're going to go to for that one thing or like that one sort of topic, you know, and I think it's hard for, uh, you know, for you to sort of really, like you said, thread out everything else. And I so like, I don't know. It's like, we, we started using Slack and I know this is kind of going off on a tangent, you know, for like when we bring, come together as a group at school, you know, we're like everything has to go through Slack and it's just sort of a way to sort of channel that discussion because it does get so splintered across so many different areas. Mm. And maybe and for I, me it's because I don't have unrestricted access. Correct. It's always a, 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 a series of hoops for me to be able to check Twitter. And to be able to look sort of at, at other other sites. And so that makes it a little bit more difficult as well. So I find myself kind of pulling back from that. And I wonder if that's what our students here in China go through. There are ways to get access to it. It's just inconvenient. Mm. But I don't think students in general are very interested in Twitter. They don't see it as a tool. I had a conversation with my son because he actually asked to join Twitter and I was very surprised and when I delve a little bit deeper and ask like yeah sure but you know what are you going to use it for to join it to follow the company that releases the games because they also release tips for the games so he doesn't use it himself as a communication tool or to get other information other than following that one company that releases those tools and so when I asked him are his friends using it as well only those friends that were interested in getting the same sort of tips and you know pre-release dates for their gaming um, coming out so that, that was really fascinating my daughters have never ever been interested in Twitter for a while they were right into Instagram and neither of them really got into Snapchat either. So um, that was interesting too. So even in their late 20s, they're not interested in picking up um, Snapchat, but they are both becoming um, very, what's the word, uh, prevalent on Instagram. Hmm. 
You know, I think some of that the, comes back to Ben's point about it's what you bring to the tool too. And I know we're yeah. all, all of us are often involved in working with teachers who are new to like building a personal learning network. And I think many of us will advocate for Twitter first. And the main mm -hmm. to get over is being a lurker versus being a contributor. And I think that's where I am right now. Like I started as a lurker and then I was ma massive contributor and had lots of conversations. But now I feel like I'm so busy prioritizing my time means that I'm not giving as much to Twitter conversations as I could and therefore it's becoming less relevant to me. So my, my hurdle is my own time management, whereas Clint's hurdle maybe is his access. You know, I think that's a really good point, mm -hmm. Ben, that you, for all of these tools, you get out of them what you put into them. Most definitely. I, I think, think Kim, go ahead. What you were saying, Chrissy, is, um, you know, how how these what what they're using it for so you're saying your son goes and he uses it for this so when i was teaching the these this class of freshmen at uk i asked them we did a you know a thing on social media and they listed all the social media channels that they used and then they listed how they used them mm. and they were they were like very specific reasons for using each different mm. social media site and like for twitter they said they used it to know what was going on I don't think they were contributing. They just wanted to know, like, that was the place you went to find out what was happening. Yeah. And so, you know, and they had, like, all the different things. They had, like, Facebook, and then they had their fake Facebook account, you know, and they had, like, all the different reasons that they used it, you know, and it was, it was super interesting. The, um, the way that they use Instagram, or many of the students use Instagram, is very different to the way I use it. Um, so the students would typically have between um, probably 10, 15 posts maximum, which they constantly yes. update and constantly delete. And if they don't get enough likes straight away on the one that they've just uploaded, then they'll delete that one because that's not... So it's a very carefully curated presence, um, which puts them in a very good light. And that contrasts quite starkly with the way they use Snapchat which is the more everyday, nothing grainy, doesn't have to be perfect, it appears after a while. So I think they're navigating the public privateness of those spaces as well, and it's quite interesting. I mean, I was just like, what? You use it like that? It just would never occur to me. Yeah, I think our, um, our youth are getting much more aware of what they put out there is really going out there because of like what Ben said, there's the fake Facebook account. They have Finstas now. They have the account that's going to be public and the one that they're like curating for those colleges that are going to come recruiting or their future, you know, employers. And they're very aware of their public presence online. So I think in a way they're, they're really just becoming more educated about their identity, their digital identity. And that's really showing in the way that they use social media today, ways that you and I never thought of when we joined MySpace way back in the day. I don't know what you're talking about. We're all a pretty um, similar group in terms of our experiences primarily with international schools. I know that everybody has had different life experience, but I wonder, do you think that this awareness of public versus private is more so among a certain, di a certain demographic, or do you think that's really becoming prevalent with all younger people, or is it because in our international schools we're pushing this? I don't safety? think it's just international school because... I heard it because I teach young children, so I didn't learn about this whole Finsta deal until I took a, my master's graduate class on social media and learning. It came from a public school teacher who's teaching in high school in the States. So it's becoming very common for any youth who's on social media of some form. And it, their access is so much higher than it used to be because of mobile devices. So I think well, I that it is spreading. And maybe situational because... Like, well, okay, it's three years ago now, but when I was teaching this class of freshmen, I was shocked and frightened for them. Like, I was scared. Like, they had no clue. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know, they, uh, it was like, I was, I, I don't know, I, it was very difficult for me to, like, <laughs> communicate the, like, <laughs> the, the weight of the situation. And they were just sort of like, kind of, not all of them, but some of them were completely clueless to, like, the whole concept of, like, stuff not going away. You know, like, I feel like now, though, it's probably the older generations that probably are, are leaving more of a kind of a, a bad mark against their name than, than the younger generation. I think we probably scared them so much about, you know, this is going on your permanent record and digital footprint and it's a tattoo and it's never going away. 
and you'll never get into college and you'll never get into a job, you know, that you want, that they're totally freaked out. And now it's all Finstas and Rinstas and fake Facebooks and all of that. Whereas the, you know, I think about like my parents and my aunts and my uncles and they're like, I'm like, really, you're going to put that out there? Okay. <laughs> Interesting choice. I think the state of U.S. politics has done a lot to highlight mm. the power of your voice in social media mm -hmm. spaces and, and how that makes you look <laughs> to others. That is probably very true, but I also think it's, it's probably true around the world. You know, I think there's a, a bit of a, a discord going on politically in lots of different places, and so now everyone has a forum, everyone has a voice. Yeah. But people don't realize the lasting effect of that voice sometimes. So I was just listening to a really great podcast. Sorry. I want to take the conversation say, a slightly different direction. So you go, Brian. Yeah, I was just going to say that what's interesting about social media is, uh, I don't know if people realize it, but it becomes an echo chamber for your own thoughts. And so it's, it's people will, will be spouting a minority point of view and they'll get people to agree with them and then you get this sort of curated world view that everyone agrees with you but that's not actually the case and and if we look at social media and politics i think that's what we're seeing right now it's yeah. a good point okay so just to kind of like come tie this conversation together and then i have something interesting that maybe we'll have time for maybe we won't if we're looking at this uh, social media tools, the purpose behind them and all the different forms that we've all mentioned is this idea of communication and sharing. And people are using them in all different ways. Is there anything that kind of binds them together or is there any kind of like key element that's really important that would make it relevant for teachers to be thinking about bringing social media or elements of social media communication into their classroom? Like why should, why should educators or even parents care about these tools and how we're using them. Why is this important to us? I still think Twitter is the best tool for learning professionally to, to uh, build out. So for teachers, Twitter is still the, the tool to go, and especially in a conference setting. I think mm -hmm. Twitter has always been the best tool to connect with uh, parallel conversations that are happening through the space and then continuing that conversation when the conference ends. Um, so from a teacher standpoint, Twitter is still the king. I think that for like teaching purposes and for parents to understand why teachers should or you know, incorporate social media into their practice, it really is about mirroring the way we communicate in the real world. So like literacy cannot be limited to text on a page anymore. It, it's visual, it's dynamic, it's multimodal. And in many ways, that needs to be mirrored in the classroom from the beginning. So bringing in aspects of social media, it doesn't have to be public social media. Mm. I still think social media can be defined by things like a padlet that's contained between my class and the class across the hall. It doesn't have to be a global space just yet, but practices that encourage skills that will translate into more public spaces are necessary, I think, almost immediately. It's just the way the world is going to be communicating any, in any Absolutely. aspect, whether it be uh, privately, whether it be publicly, whether it be at work, at home. It is just the way and the tools that we're going to use to communicate with each other. So that in itself just makes it a very important reason to bring aspects of it into the classroom well i like that concept that it's a piece of literacy like it's an aspect of literacy mm. sorry carrie lee go ahead i read something interesting this morning i'm just seeing if i can find it about um media literacy and how important it is for a digital citizenship and i sort of think it really comes down to that communication but what it was saying was that we need to move from the idea and notion of digital citizenship being to do with internet safety and protectionism to a view, and I'm reading off the page now, to a view of digital citizenship that's proactive and prioritizes media literacy and media citizens. A good digital citizen doesn't just dodge safety and privacy pitfalls, but works to remake the world aided by digital technology so it is more thoughtful, inclusive, and just. And that was in um, Mindshift this morning. 
So that sort of made me think in terms of this, um, we're, we're, com we're communicating in our own little communities, but wherever we do, we need to make sure that we're helping students learn how to do that in a positive way. That's not going to contribute to the sort of things that you were talking about with the US politics online. And the thing is, what I always like to say is that they're using these spaces, whether or not we're teaching them how to be better people in these spaces. So it's the whole point of education, right, is for us to be the best version of ourselves that we can be and contribute the most positively to our community and the, you know, the global world, the wider, wider look. And if we're not teaching kids how to do that in authentic spaces, then we're not really teaching kids how to do that. Well, well, when I was kids to be you know, change makers, sorry. go ahead, Rebecca. If we want our kids to be change makers and we want our kids to have a voice and to make waves and to shake things up, the spaces where that's happening is online. Like that is where change is happening. Um, it's where people find communities. It's it's the language of those spaces. It's the use of hashtags as uh, as a way to make change or to share messages or to find communities. Um, and if kids can, and if kids are, are people are flexible enough to be in different spaces in which to make change, then I think that's pretty powerful. Um, and I think that's what many of us, why many of us went into teaching is because we wanted kids to make the world a better place and is dark and dirty as the internet can be and Twitter and all of those spaces can be, our kids have the ability to have a voice as they get in whatever space, at whatever is the appropriate level at a certain point. And we have to teach them the language and we have to teach them the, the protocols and the norms of those spaces um, so that they can hit the ground running. Absolutely. Yeah, I was gonna say actually kind of piggybacking on that was that when I was using um, like Twitter and we were voice thread and, and such with them, um, my kids and we had Instagram and they were, they were sharing with certain classes and they, and they just sort of like, it just dawned on them like one day, like, wow, these people are, they're like, just like me. They're like across the world and they're just like me. They like the same things. They, they do the same things, you know, they know the same things. And it was just really cool for them, even at that young to like sort of start with that idea of community. It, it's not just localized. It's like, there's like-minded people all over the world. And, and they were like, you could see it kind of just the light bulb went off and they were like so cool. They were like so excited to be able to sharing with these people around like stuff that they thought was cool, you know, at six. So uh, I agree with you, Rebecca, a hundred percent. And Ben, I'm curious, Ben, I'm curious with you, when did that light bulb go off on your head? Well, that's why I started using it with my kids. So okay. the, the light bulb went off actually. So when I, when I moved to a uh, really remote, uh, place and uh, was teaching a new grade level and I was like, oh, okay, like I don't know anything. I need to connect with people. There was no, I didn't have any partner teachers. There was one section per grade level. And so I just reached out um, to other teachers, kindergarten teachers. And then just, there's this, you know, I was like connecting with these world-class teachers. I was like, oh my goodness, you know? And then I thought, why, why, why should I not be able to provide this for my kids as well? You know, so that was kind of like the aha moment. Earlier, Brian was talking about echo chambers and how social media, you know, can turn into this echo chamber. And I think what Ben was just talking about is an example of it really, in that instance, it's also an echo chamber, but I think that's for a positive amplification rather than a reduction, right? So you're kind of echoing your voice out to, as in an inclusive way rather than in a, what's the opposite of inclusive, non-inclusive way. Um, you know, and I, so I think that sword cuts both ways. And if we realize and if we can teach our students that that's the case and how to harness that going for the positive then rather than the negative, I think that's something as well. I think, you know, we had to learn how to do this ourselves. We, we've we learned to navigate it in a way that works for us. Other people don't have that luxury or haven't had the experiences that we've had and they have difficulty navigating that and maybe seeing the possibilities. We have the ability to teach students to find those possibilities as well. And I think that's that's a not an easy thing to do, but it's an important thing to do. All right, we're winding up our call. And I think these are really great sentiments to kind of wrap up our conversation. But I'm going to put everyone on the spot. I feel really bad. No one, no one knows that I'm about to ask this. 
Is there anything that you guys have read? And Ka Carrie Lee inspired me, so I'm blaming Carrie Lee for this. Is there anything <laughs> no. that you guys have read or seen in since the last time we chatted, or since ever, since this is our first call, that you think kind of relates and comes back to this conversation that's worth sharing with others? And I will go first because I'm putting you guys on the spot and I feel bad about doing that. Um, I happen to be listening to a podcast today called Note to Self, which is one of my all-time favorite podcasts. And I want to give you the episode number, but of course my phone is just showing me a completely blank screen right now. So let's see if that opens up. Um, it's called Go Ahead, Miss Out is the one. And I don't see an episode number. Wait, hold on. It's from December 28th, 2016. And um, what I think is really interesting, and the reason why I think it's relevant to this conversation is they are talking about uh, FOMO versus JOMO, so fear of missing out versus joy of missing out. And the element that's resonating with me in this conversation is they're talking about in the initial groups of people who first started communicating and connecting in online spaces, one of the things that they did to make those spaces really purposeful and valuable and comfortable for everyone was to define the parameters of communication, what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is not acceptable. And of course, the example that they're sharing in this podcast is YouTube comments. Um, and we could use Twitter as another example where these companies are big enough to define the acceptable behavior in, in their spaces and to basically just boot people out if they can't follow the rules, but they don't. And so the way this is connecting for me is we're all talking about raising you know global citizens who care about the world and want to make it a better place if we're all thinking about how we can make these spaces spaces where people want to be and where people feel safe and and um, able to share without you know kind of nasty language or completely inappropriate behavior our kids need to be expect that and be able to share that with others and hold others accountable and so i think we have a really important role to play in we could just kind of let for example, YouTube comments continue to like be more and more disgusting, or we can raise the bar and help our kids raise the bar so that we're creating community spaces that are spaces that are good, mm -hmm. <laughs> not you know just a place to trash talk. Well, I can piggyback on that because like I kind of feel like um, that reads back into how I feel about all of this as being illiteracy because the internet can seem like a really dark place because there are people out there who are not fluent. And I don't mean fluent in the tool, I mean fluent literate. And so um, it brings me back to something that I am reading now, but it's not a current resource. Uh, it's a book by Clive Thompson, Smarter Than You Think. And in the book, he talks about how um, before the internet, people basically stopped writing after they left school. Apart from the like note card or letter occasionally, but now people are writing on a daily basis in various formats, and we aren't teaching them how to debate and how to argue on these formats to actually be intelligent and mindful of what they say. And so for me, that really relates to the conversation that we've been having about it. There's something that I found this morning on Twitter. So yay, Twitter's still going strong. Um, it's called Project Rocket um, or Rocket TV. And it's real talk on tough topics. And some of the things that they talk about, cyberbullying, belonging, social media, reputation. But if you go a little bit deeper, they're talking about what if I get hassled for photos I don't want to send? How can I support someone whose photo was leaked? How do I challenge gender stereotypes? So I think there's there's places out there that are developing these this content where you have to talk about difficult things and I think that's a really great one it's out of Australia Chrissy I don't know if you're familiar with it um from where you are Project rocket look it up I guess I don't I'll, have anything I'll, so someone else can go <laughs> I'll, I'll step in um uh I've been this year has been actually this past month has been, or past two months, have been really intense of sort of Denmark has become like an onion and I'm peeling away so many opportunities for learning. And which one do I pick to share with you? I'm going to pick the one that, that uh, happened a few weeks ago. I went to my uh, first hackathon 
And they've just got so many of these hackathons happening in Denmark. And this one was about food, about farmers and um, getting the food to to the urban center. I didn't get to participate from the beginning, but I got to participate near the end just to see how the hackathon worked. And it was just interesting because how it works is uh, strangers come to this hackathon. They don't know each other. Then they form groups and they have these teams. And then they come up with uh, solutions to the problems that are presented to them by all these different companies. And then 20, about 24 hours later, they have to present their ideas. And then there's a jury that votes on who they think is the best, and then they are awarded cash prizes or office spaces to de further develop their uh, solutions. This is designed for university students and profession professionals, but I'm thinking, why not for students? Um, how can we make this an activity for, uh, for students? So the challenge is I'm trying to troubleshoot this in my mind. What kind of rewards or what kind of benefits could students have if they won uh, in an idea of, to, a, to a solution or to a problem that, that companies are offering. So um, I know in our school, for instance, we've got four greenhouses on top of each of our towers, and they're empty and they got nothing on them. And we don't have the money to put anything into it. So maybe in the future, we'll have a hackathon at our school to address that problem. Um, I just went through my Twitter trying to find like the most recently favorite, and it turns out that I don't use Twitter that way quite so much, <laughs> um, or at least recently, my Twitter use has changed. Um, so, and I am not reading right now. My brain can't handle a lot of excess reading. Um, but I have been watching Rhett and Link on YouTube, who are like some top YouTubers. I don't know what, like they're, they make bank, they make money. Um, and they've just been bought out by, I don't know if they've been bought out. They're being sponsored by YouTube and they're getting a lot of feedback from their community that they've spent probably five or six years building. Um, mostly younger people. It's fun. It's like stupid TV just on YouTube. And it's really kind of cool just to watch what stupid YouTube is and how like professional it is now and how much money is going into it and how they build community and how they speak to their community and, and how it's really just a good way to turn off your brain for like a good 15 minutes and you can go down a little wormhole and watch a lot of Rhett and Link. Um, but I think kind of watching some of that stuff is actually worthwhile because you see, we assume that we know what kids are going to create on YouTube or with their voices, but they might just be making stupid stuff that makes them money. And that's kind of cool too. Um, it's the community aspect of the YouTube YouTubers is pretty amazing. I think that is so fascinating. I am just endlessly fascinated by the community building on YouTube. Yeah. Like just endlessly fascinated. So cool. Anybody yeah. else have something to share? Otherwise I will take the pressure off. Well, I have one book to share that I'm currently wrapping up called uh, Rethinking Readiness. Um, preparing kids for like college work and life. And it's all about deeper learning. It's quite interesting because I'm like obsessing on school models right now. Um, so it's uh, a pretty, Pretty cool book if you have if you want to like if you're interested in like learning about different um, or like sort of models that encourage deeper learning rather than siloed subjects and stuff. So it's pretty good. Awesome. I'm gonna pass. All right. Yeah, I'm doing lots of reading, but it hasn't got anything to do with social media. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time on this call this evening, and I can't wait to have another conversation with you soon. Um, so stay tuned to our YouTube Live channel to see more from the Aduro Learning Advisory Board. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.